Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 28, 2020, are the complementary first reading is Jeremiah 28, 5 through 9. The semi-continuous first reading is Genesis 22, 1 through 14. The psalm is Psalm 89, 1 through 4, and then 15 through 18. The second reading is Romans chapter 6, 12 through 23. And the gospel, Matthew chapter 10, 40 to 42. There you have it. It's kind of mean we had a lot of long readings from Matthew, and now you just get three verses here. How does that mean? I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Say more. Well, I well, I think it's great because uh, Caroline, would, Caroline would rather have all of John nine, <laughs> and then than three verses of Matthew. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, no, I think it's great because um, this verse has been floating around a lot lately in uh, social media, uh, particularly, uh, well, you know, uh, most recently with regard to issues around immigration, uh, but, uh, but it has a tendency to rise up in uh in ways in which there it it calls attention to who is it that we who is it that we receive who is it that we uh welcome and so uh this might only be three verses but there's a lot to unpack i think in these three verses and what does it mean to welcome uh, and uh, particularly in the ubiquity of welcome statements and, uh, and all are welcome. And uh, I would like to see a preacher uh, really unpack that and say, let's put it back into its context. Let's say what's going, you know, what's going on here. It's actually a relatively uh, uh, infrequent verb uh, in Matthew. It's just in this chapter and I think one other time. Uh, and we first hear it in 1014, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. And then we get um, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. So I, uh, yeah, this is one of those passages that I'm, that's why I'm glad it's a, <laughs> it's a shorter one because there's a lot, lot here that um, I think is really, really important to say uh, um, what, what does it mean to welcome? What is Jesus talking about here? Uh, and we have the theme of righteousness again, which goes back to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and we have the theme also of little ones, will, which Jesus will describe his disciples like that in chapter 18. Uh, and uh, so that, yeah, that's a really long answer to your question, Matt. You forgot reward as a theme. Oh, well. Insert Lutheran joke here, right? But there's also this theme about receiving rewards uh, in, in exchange or as at the end for your, for your good works. That, yeah, that that's out. true too. So. The patterning of this, of this little passage is interesting for a sermon that's maybe more meditative that allows people to sit and dwell with the passage for a little bit because it can be read. I don't know if it's ever been set to music or not, but it does have a, a different kind of cadence than most narrative texts or most sayings of Jesus. Well, I think it's also important that, I mean, we know, we know we've been in chapter 10, but uh, but that this is, this comes at the end of these uh, at these instructions. You look at verse eleven. Uh, verse eleven is a transition. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. And so, I think the preacher also needs to ask, what difference does it make that these words are that which ends this this particular narrative section? Why is it that it's a focus on welcoming and it's a focus on uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, 
it's it's these kinds of injunctions that end the, this larger instructional passage and what difference does it make uh, as opposed to having this somewhere earlier on in the passage I think that 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 it ends with this gives it a kind of uh, rhetorical gravity um, and substance that uh, that's important to think about as well I want to hear what the rest of you not I'm not Sons, Caroline, but how all of us think about how this text sounds now in the midst of a pandemic and, and distancing. I, some of our listeners have perhaps started meeting in person or maybe outdoors. Uh, my church probably will not be open until 2021 for, for corporate worship. And a lot of that depends upon, well, <laughs> what's going to happen next couple of weeks after we record this. I mean, this, we're in a fluid situation, but welcoming is one of the things that's changed dramatically for congregations right now. So on the one hand, people are able to eavesdrop on services at churches they've never attended uh, and can feel welcome without having to identify themselves or be seen, be visible, have their hands shaken, nobody talking to them, which is I think still a, a really valid and important form of, of being open and welcoming. But we can't, you know, we don't encounter strangers the way we used to. Uh, at least I sure don't. And so it's harder for a church to express welcome in some settings than it was four or five months ago. Yeah, since welcome is a fluid situation, Matt, I suggest that we use cold water. Okay. Was that the loop <laughs> we're talking yes. I just wanted to get that joke in there. Sorry. I totally, I have no idea what just happened here. Fluid situation, whoever gives cold water. Oh, I get it. Okay. I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I'll get a whiteboard out or flannel graph and map, map my jokes, Matt, since they're not funny, apparently. A flannel thanks, graph. I remember flannel graphs. So my he, dad used to do sermons with flannel graphs, and those were my favorite sermons. He would have this, <laughs> he would have a, like a baby blue flannel, flannel graph and all these little, you know, this little. Thanks for respecting my question, all of you. I'm just going to. There's a certain amount <laughs> welcoming of a certain age group when you go to flannel crowd. I know. <laughs> no, I, I do want to respect the question, but I just could not help to get that joke in. Uh, but because uh, I have a question, uh, first a response and then, a, a, then an honest question. Um, I do think that um, the pastors who I have talked to have talked about all sorts of people being involved in online worship and participating through in drive-through communion and, and things like that, or drive-in worship that hadn't been coming to the building. Um, people not who are maybe on the roster of a congregation, but hadn't been actively involved for years. But so I do think that right now the, the change situation at the very least expands our notion of what it is uh, for welcome. And I think that's really important. Uh, here's my question exegetically. Um, so here's what's weird, right, uh, to me. Who, whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet, who welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person, and who um, offers a cup of cold water to the little ones in the name of a disciple. What is that? What is that in the name of a prophet, in the name of a righteous person, in the name of a disciple? What is that three full grip? What does that mean? Uh, I know what it is to welcome somebody in the name of Jesus, but not in the name of a prophet or in the name of a righteous person or in the name of a disciple. What does that mean? What is that idiom? That's a good question. I hadn't looked at it like that before, Ralph. There's something you can do with that in the Greek, Caroline or Matt? I don't. No, all no, questions so. have answers. <laughs> it's a pretty good translation. Yeah, I had yeah. That before that. That is worth going into. But to to go back to your question, Matt, um, I you know when we first found ourselves in this uh, uh, in this lockout, um, one of the statements that many people began to say, "Up, oh, he's going for the books." Uh, one of the things that uh, folks started to say is that the church has left the building. And that that was good news. And so um, when I think about this welcome, 
uh, in the in the same reality that we've lived through these last few months. It's not welcoming to my building or to my fellowship of worship or even to my Zoom channel or Facebook page, but it is genuinely how do we welcome the other? And uh, that has been seen in the protests, that has been seen in um, the exchanges of folks uh, on their Facebook feed as they talk about uh, what's been happening um, in light of um, George Floyd's death. And uh, I, I think that there's a sense in which there is a welcome from the church people in the name of the church that is beyond the building or beyond um, the, um, uh, well, that is beyond the building that I think is probably as powerful a way to read this text than simply to look at, you know, the fact that our online numbers are higher than our in-person numbers were if we counted bodies. I have an answer about in the name of but I don't want to take the conversation a different direction. Well, I, I, I always try to ask questions I honestly don't know the answer to, so I would really like to know uh, what you think. Well, I should have looked this up in advance. Donald Sr. says it's, come, it's a, a, a Semitic idiom, but uh, so there you go, Old Testament guy. But what does it mean? But it's, <laughs> uh, that it's because that's who they are. So whoever welcomes a prophet precisely because they are a prophet gets a reward. Whoever welcomes one of these little ones because they are a disciple it's a reward. So I would say it's a kind of acknowledge Very helpful. It's not so much an office, but acknowledging that the, the authenticity, I don't, I don't like using that word that much anymore because it's so overused, but the integrity or the dignity of somebody precisely because they are. So somebody who welcomes a believer precisely because they're a believer in the name of Christ or who welcomes a stranger precisely because they're valued. I would I would say it's it's beyond just a welcome that says, well, we welcome everybody here. But no, it's a welcome that tends to the identity of the person you are welcoming in. That's that's attentive to who they are, where they come from, what they value, what they need, and so on. And also to to piggyback on what I was just saying, um, I I love that Matt because it 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 recognizes the fact that. Um, my racial identity, um, my gender identity um, does not supersede the fact that you should see me as another follower of Christ, as another person created in the image of God. Which is so crucial when it comes to churches, right? Or a congregation that, to, to push us away from the old melting pot imagery, right? We're all the same here, there is no culture here, you know, but no, we need to, what does it mean to respect um, distinction? Uh, not to, and of course, it's, the trick is not to imply, impute value to that, right? Or, or some get more power than others. But um, which I think churches are slowly starting to figure out that that, um, but what that looks like. Um, this is a day where people's identities are so important, and we I think we finally recognize they're so complex and changing, fluid. I might even say, Rolf, that. Um, that how we dignify that is a means of dignifying a person. Are we on the same page? Am I hearing you right? Not yeah, to, I'm worried, Joy, that I took it a different direction. Not not to put cold water on what you just said, but... Um, but Touche. <laughs> I just had to go there. See what you started, Ralph? Come on, Caroline, jump in here. I I I do want to I do want to back up Matt and to say that uh, it, there is something to have the modified identity be the primary identity, in the sense where um, if my modified identi identity identity is as a person of color, um, let that be modified by my Christian faith, and we are together in that as opposed to ignoring the fact that we are fo uh, fellow followers of Christ so that you can highlight the difference. And I, I, I think that goes along with your statement that I think churches are doing it better. But maybe we should move on now. Well, one thing, one other thing I want to say is that, uh, that one of the, again, this is sort of a subterranean theme here, is that 
Um, once again, this passage assumes sentness. It assumes apostolicity. So it to be welcome means that you're uh, out there. <laughs> and, uh, and so once again, we come back to this, uh, this the great commission of, of Matthew uh, and at the end, but, um, but also that what you were talking about earlier in terms of the inability of the, of the it, it's not in the church's nature to be contained. Uh, and by a building or anything else. And so uh, the, the way in which this passage assumes that, and then, and then as a result, assumes a kind of uh, vulnerability um, that, uh, and exposure that, um, that's, that's not always comfortable um, and, and, and rejection. And that's in part what's implied here as well. So just because you're, uh, just because you're sent, of course, doesn't mean that that's going to be, there's perception. <laughs> that's right. Well, that was a lot to get out of a few verses, eh? See? There you go. Yeah, let's, let's jump to the um, complimentary Old Testament lesson, Jeremiah 28. And I, I would refer to people somewhat to, um, to the commentary on the website. So you're, jump, you're dropping down at the end of a, a much longer passage that then also continues. So actually, so you're in the middle. It's really an odd place. It's obviously picked up here because of the prophet. Uh, as for the prophet who prophesies uh, peace, when that prophet, when the word of that prophet from two will be known that uh, this is truly a prophet. And the point, of course, is that Hananiah, um, Jeremiah's opponent in this text, is not a true prophet. Uh, the longer narrative is he, Jeremiah has made a yoke to say as a prophetic sign act and Hananiah breaks the yoke and say, the Lord will break the yoke of Babylon and Jeremiah mocks him. And this is the mocking speech. Um, so, so, you know, when it says, amen, may the Lord do so, may the Lord fulfill the words, Jeremiah is actually mocking Hananiah at this point. And uh, a reader who just gets up and reads it might read this sincerely. Uh, which is not at all the tone. So if you're going to jump in, you've got a lot of storytelling to do to, to, to build the context of this passage. Ask your reader to contact Rolf for like a sarcasm reading lesson or something like that. You know, right? I'm just the guy. Whoever welcomes a sarcastic person in the name of a sarcastic person should call me. <laughs> so that's really... Uh, anything. I don't have any much, a whole lot more to say about this other than you'd have to really do a lot of building to build a sermon around this. That sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> that is important work, uh, especially in, in, in the midst of this time um, where, um, you know, the, the, the end of that text, if you don't recognize the fact that he's being sarcastic, if you don't recognize that he is calling out the one who has spoken peace, um, then you miss the opportunity to speak into the context that we live in right now, where people are saying that there is peace and there is no peace. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's worth, you know, if, if you're doing a Bible study on the lectionary this week with people, this is worth going into. You know, it, the word peace here really means God's going to do well by us. Uh, it, it's all good. Uh, the prophet who says, it's all good, you know, that, that's really what um, the prophets of peace are saying. But Genesis 22 is really worth dwelling with for a while for people who are doing this semi-continuous Old Testament track. Here is, you know, the, the binding of Isaac. Holy smokes, we could, we could have spent 30 minutes talking just about this text. Is it too soon to make a joke about Genesis 22? It's never too soon to make a joke about Genesis 22. I think this is a text that people understand a lot better now in light of the uh, quarantining. And I know some parents of children who used to be mortified by this text, but now can suddenly understand. Just it's saying. Not, it's, it's not too soon. Present company excluded. It's a terrible text. I hate it. I think I'm glad it's in the Bible just because we get to wrestle with it and ask why is this here. But I really, um, 
I really have a hard time being drawn to this uh, if, if I were a preacher, but some people have committed to do Genesis all summer, so I guess I have to say something helpful, don't I? Say more about your discomfort, though, because uh, you're not the only one for, for whom that would be true. Is that a polite Minnesota way of saying you too? She's not Minnesotan. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Soda yet. Neither am I, but I guess I've, I don't know, 18 years. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, is it a story about learning? Is it a story that where, where God discovers that God made a mistake as well? You know, that's kind of, I think, a modern take on it. Um, I read Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard in college. Uh, you know, this is, it's a text that confronts us with the question of what if the divine is a monster, morally speaking? I don't think that's true, but at least it, we have to sit with that question for a minute and ask that. What if the source of power in the universe is actually morally capricious or just likes to mess with the creation? I don't believe that's true because of other texts, but here's a really foundational text that at least makes me realize the importance of sitting with that question. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, there's something about God's test even if God knows it's all going to end okay, that just strikes me as cruel. And Abraham's willingness, even if Abraham presumes that it's all going to end okay, that just strikes me as a little cruel. So, Not the first one out of that. I'm so, sorry. Ralph, I, I'm, I jumped in on you. Uh, so, Ralph, my time to ask a question of you. Uh, in the context of, of this ancient uh, culture, where gods would ask for the sacrifice of children. Um, am I reading too much into this or apologizing too much to say that this is a demonstration of, of how we are willing to do what we think everybody else expects of their God? And this text shows at the end that the God we serve is not like everybody else's God. That's certainly been one of the um, defensible traditional interpretations of this text, that Israel is surrounded by nations that do call for child sacrifice, and many within Israel, including its later kings, um, practice child sacrifice. They pass their son through the fire. And um, for those kings, you got to remember, if a king has, you know, 30, 40 wives and concubines, um, and you can, and we talked last week about inheritance, and only one can inherit the throne. Um, an excess of sons, and and you know, be, thinking that God would be sat, satisfied, they were willing to do this, um, and partially by making it about the only son. You know, Abraham has two sons. Ishmael's already been taken from him. So when God says, "Take your son, your only son, Isaac, the one whom you love." And Abraham's name means father of many. So father of many, take your son, your only son, Isaac, the one whom you love, right? That it's, it's the way of piling up the fact that it's not true. He's not the only son, but yet, sorry, he is because the only one left. And the enormity, and certainly uh, one of the traditional tra uh, meanings of the passage has been God does not command um, sacrifice. I think another brilliant thing about this text is um, that it doesn't say how old Isaac is here, only that Ishmael is gone. And how you picture Abraham and Isaac physically in terms of age and health totally changes the story. So um, if you are picturing Isaac as a young, vulnerable child, and Abraham still is a hail, middle-aged man like Matt, um, still vibrant. Um, but if you picture, uh, my son just turned uh, 16 yesterday, and he's, six, he's better than six foot four. If you picture Isaac as a six foot four, 200-pound uh, 16-year-old, and his dad is like me, old and frail, 
So the question is, is this a story of Abraham willing to sacrifice his son? That's really how Islam looks at this story, although they think it's Ishmael. Christianity in its later, uh, in its after the first centuries took this No, This is the story of a, a hail son who could have escaped this, but who carries the wood for his own sacrifice on his own shoulders to his own near death. And then Judaism focused this on God who provides. God will always provide. So j just to notice how what you bring to the story totally changes it. And then the three Abrahamic traditions bring a fundamentally different lens. And I think that's, uh, at least it's a great Bible study, even if it's not a great sermon. I mean, it is a great sermon, but you might so horrify people. But I actually, last thing about Matt's thing about the horror of this text is, for those of us who have grown up with gold crosses and have taken the, the cross at face value and the face we put on it is golden, um, the fact that God himself, as the incarnate son of God, is willing to do this, I think this story at least helps us recover also something of the foolishness of the cross, as Paul says in um, 1 Corinthians. Much more could be said, but we are at 26 minutes, and I can't wait to get to Romans. Uh, and how we construct sin and how we think about how we think about how sin is active um, uh, and powerful in our lives, I think is actually a, a, a really critical question right now. It's always been. But the way in which uh, historically the church and the members of it have indiv so individualized sin or located sin as a as 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 more as a kind of moral behavior or an uh, an activity uh, that that the way in which we I mean the way in which Paul talks about sin here is a is a kind of um, is a kind of power that I think allows the preacher to talk about uh, the nature of sin in a more communal uh, and uh, institutional systemic kind of concept uh, and the ways in which, uh, the, and the ways in which we as individuals are complicit in it. Uh, and so I, I think, I, I don't wanna say wonderful text, but I think it could be a really important text for the ways in which Paul is, uh, is articulating uh, how um, th this is the, this is the this is the nature of what sin does. It it invites complacency, um, and it uh, and it and the ways in which we are able to name the kinds of sin that it's outside of ourselves, but yet yet so uh, that we don't think that it has anything to do with us because we have so individualized sin or made it a kind of you know acting out of a certain kind of behavior but the way in which we, um, th that kind of bondage to sin uh, is, is so, um, so systemic that uh, that's what I would do with this text if I were, and then just take it head on and not really mess around. <laughs> no messing around here because, and that's what, and that's what the passage, the, the, that's what this passage I think invites. Matt made this statement last week, and um, I just want to reiterate it, where he um, pointed out that we need to spend our time with this text and to learn from it new. And um, th there are these traditional ways of reading um, Romans kind of in these fit categories, and I really appreciate, Caroline, you turning the tables on that just enough to say, this says something that is not quite so, oh yeah, I've memorized this portion of Romans, I know exactly what this means, but let's, as Matt said, let's linger here and let's not take those normal interpretations of what we think we know it means and allow it to speak afresh to us. Um, a, 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 a hard word that is a word of grace. Um, from last week, the text uh, sets us between the the reign of Adam, the reign of sin, uh, to the reign of Christ, the reign of grace. And um, as, as Matt brings up, we're going to keep talking about that. But if you set it back from last week, we're talking about what does it mean to not be overrun by this sin, but to be overrun by God's grace.